well, you are quite aware that we are from August Town. Yeah. And um, we chose to be part of this um, movement um, at short notice because of its importance to the development of August Town and particularly our youngsters. Um, we are greatly offended by the fun that is poked at Alexander Bedward. And he is virtually our mentor. Um, he has put forward a philosophy of development. We are certain that he is a development um, practitioner extraordinaire. His contemporaries included Marcus Garvey and uh, Leonard Howell, who was the first Rastafarian and who had the philosophy that um, Hale Selassie was the chosen one and that they would have worshipped him. Now, we are not putting forward the philosophy of anybody. But Leonard Howell was very important because like ourselves in Augustown, he established a community in St. Catherine known as Pinnacle. And the honorable thing about him was that he purchased 520 acres of land in order to establish this community if they weren't squatters. Now, we in Augustown, we do not regard ourselves as squatters either because Mr. Bedward leased the land on which we have Bedward's churchyard, now known as Judgment Yard. And it is coincidental that it is the same place where Mr. Bedward has his office that um, Miguel Collins, otherwise known as Sizzler, has developed out of. And there are many other talented people in the community. And there is also um, some people in the community here, like Mr. Rutherford, who does not want me to reveal the open secret that he is a different descendant. Um, that's Mr. Michael Rutherford over there. Um, that he is a descendant of one of the elders of Alexander Bedwell. I myself is also a descendant of one of Mr. Bedward's um, um, leaders. So this morning, I bring you greetings from Augustown. We also have Augustown Arise, which is an event, an emancipation celebration, where we have an expo on the 1st of August to present cultural offering, offerings as well as um, products which were produced by residents of Augustown so that they can do some business on that day. You know, my only disappointment though is that the march this morning didn't begin from Augustown. But I know that that would prove a challenge to many of you. Um, although some of you are very, very young and you could manage it because some older people some. marched on that morning. Some. <laughs> um, or even from Matilda's Corner where they were diverted and brought down to this very spot. But nonetheless, you have my highest commendation. And I think that this is the start, the beginning of things to come, of a recognition of bedwork. Now, if I should ask any of you here, who was Bedward, and what you remember of him, or what is best remembered of him, I'm almost sure that everybody will tell me that he is a madman from Augustown who attempted to fly. 
And that is the story that we know of Bedward, the man who attempted to fly. And um, indeed, the representation of this man tend to be generally negative. All that you read of him is generally negative. And this is understandable. Uh, since our history has been written from a Eurocentric, white, upper class, upper middle class perspective. And indeed, to the white, upper class, and middle class, Bedward was enigmatic in that he was vilified, yet he was feared. On the one hand, he was a schemer, extortionist, charlatan, religious fanatic, lunatic, buffoon. And on the other hand, he was a subversive, a threat to the privileged position of the upper classes. However, to the rural poor and the urban lower class, Bedward was a prophet, sh shepherd, leader, and deliverer from racial injustice, in inequality, and oppression. In other words, Bedward to, Bedward to them was Jesus Christ, incarnate in the flesh, the Word made flesh. Dwelling among the lower class black Jamaican population. And he stated that he had the mission to preach the good news to the poor and liberate the oppression, oppressed. And his message was one of action. For him, the time had come for the black majority to rise up and curb the white wall, the white minority, and take control of their destiny. But who was Bedward? What was his mission? Described as a dark man with fine features and a flowing beard, looking every inch a leader, Alexander Bedwood was born about 1859, probably on the Mona Sugar Estate, somewhere around the Standpipe area, in the parish of St. Andrew. He came from a poor family and had little by way of formal education. As an adult, he worked on the Mona Sugar Estate as a cooper. He described himself as a very religious man from early. In fact, he was a staunch member of the Providence Methodist Church. In 1883, he migrated to Panama, as many lower class Jamaicans are doing, as we'll see, to seek employment. He returned to Jamaica in 1885, but within a few days, he returned to Cologne, this time vowing never to return to the island. And you can imagine why. While in Panama, he allegedly had two visions. One in which he saw a man who told him to return to Jamaica and you will save souls and your own. In the other, he was also told by another man to go to Augustown, submit himself to Mr. Rutherford, for instruction with fasting, then baptized. For, as the, as the story continues, I have a special mission for you to accomplish. So he returned to Jamaica immediately, and in January 1886 was baptized by Harrison Shakespeare Woods, an Afro-American spiritualist and founder of the Jamaica Native Baptist Free Church. In 1891, at age 32, he became the church's leader. And in 1893, Bedward reputedly got a vision that the Hope River had many medicinal qualities and he should dispense it to the people freely and baptize them in it. He also got divine instructions to build a house for the serfs of God. And in June 1894, the cornerstone was laid at Union Camp Augustown, which became the headquarters of the Jamaica Native Baptist Free Church. The remains of the church is still there. It is being used here by another church body, but it is a Jamaica National Heritage Trust property. Bedworth's personality became so inextricably bound up with the church that it, it came to be called Bedwardism. 
and its followers, Bedwadai. Under Bedwad's leadership, the Jamaican Native Baptist Free Church was transformed from being just another lower class religious movement to its final position as a powerful religio-political mass movement, boasting a membership of over 33,000 persons, not just in Jamaica, throughout the island of Jamaica, but also in Cuba, Panama, Costa Rica, and wherever Jamaican gathered, there was a Bedouinite church and Bedouinite mission, missionaries there. Bedouin then emerged as a, one of the loudest and strongest voices of protest against the colonial government and the inherent inequities and racism in colonialism. Now for us to understand Bedward's mission and indeed his legacy, we need to examine the social, economic and political condition of Jamaica during the early 19th and 20th century. Without that background, we, can, we won't be able to understand or appreciate it. Jamaica during the period under review was shaped by the phenomenon of plantation slavery. On the foundation was built a socio-economic structure marked by racial oppression and inequity. White European values and biases permeated the entire society. During slavery, few whites and coloreds owned and controlled the means of production, land and property and capital. Blacks were the enslaved. And being associated with the powerlessness and poverty, they occupy the bottom rung of the social hierarchy. On emancipation in 1838, the power relationship did not change. In fact, the 218,000 slaves who were freed, that is over 80% of the population, were not given anything to start their new life. Very little provisions were made for them or to acquire wealth. They did not get any land. Social amenities were almost non-existent in their communities, and their political rights and privileges were extremely circumscribed. In fact, it was expected that they would continue to labor as, as wage earners on the estate, not to become independent of the estate. Land acquisition, however, was very important in the society. It had fact within it, you could gain upward social mobility as well as political rights. Land acquisition therefore became an important aspect of black lower class means of upward social mobility. But there was a problem. Land was concentrated in the hands of the white and colored land class and there was little to say. Nonetheless, by different means, many slaves gained access to land and they asserted themselves as small as a farmer. The growing numbers of black peasant farmers proved to be a problem to the local assembly as well as to the imperial government in England. Why? Because blacks became the major voters at that time. Many people feel that blacks never had the right to vote. But they became the major, the, the, the largest number of voters on the voters list. And they were more and more voting for persons whom they thought would be looking after their own interests. Mm -hmm. The result was that they were changing the complexion of the assembly and ultimately they would have changed um, move towards black majority rule. This development England could not, neither the local planter class nor, the, nor England could appreciate such a thing because blacks were not ready to govern themselves. The decision however was taken not to do anything about the situation as it was but to wait until the opportunity lend itself. Now this development this opportunity came in 1865, and I'll show you what happened. Now, during the 1860s, there was a world depression. Mm -hmm. And this depression affected Jamaica like anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And the government thought it fit 
to pass the burden onto the working poor. And so the rose taxes were, were increased, wages were reduced, cost of living increased significantly, and injustice was right. Appeals were made by the lower classes to the highest authority, but to no avail. This ultimately led to a situation of conflict, which culminated in the Morant Bay Uprising or the Morant Bay War of 1865, led by Paul Bogle, himself a deacon in the Native Baptist Church. And I want you to remember that it wasn't the Baptist Church that many Baptists that we know today, but really the lower class black Jamaican indigenous Native Baptist Church. After brutally suppressing the war, the government moved to withdraw the old constitution and introduced full crown colony government. The island was now governed directly from England. The governor was appointed from England. He had assistant, assistants coming from England, and he selected a few nominees who were drawn from the white, white planter class in the island. So here now, the country was becoming more and more white in terms of administration. The black majority was now disenfranchised. They had little political representation. Now, to prevent any form of political uprising, such as that which occurred in 1865, the government in 1867 passed the Jamaica Constabulary Force Act, which is in effect today, which has not been changed up to this day. It was a paramilitary force. In other words, they were trained in military tactics. They were trained to carry guns, and to shoot directly into any crowd during any form of mass protest. And I'm not quite sure if much has changed from the police force today. But that was the situation. The police force was, was formed to suppress and repress any form of popular protest. At the same time, these policies, these policies I'm including a land reform policy to resuscitate the plantation economy. These policies had positive effect on the economy of Jamaica. However, it had adverse effect on the mass of working class people. You know, there are some people who like to have economic growth, economic growth, economic growth. But they hardly understand that economic growth without economic development 